there and say this in case you have any other. So we now have uh, no lecture on the papers, and we moved it up. So it's um, one of these other dates that have been formally cancelled. So uh, today we will talk about um, project management and the OSS um, uh, system. And in our case, the project team. And then uh, next time we'll talk about Cafe Society. And then the May 20th we'll talk about the team. Should be up to date now. Um, the first thing I will talk about is uh, about uh, project management, and um, this is from our previous book, but uh, we don't have the book, but it's, the points are still um, understandable from the notes, so we don't need to have the book to understand the, the notes. <laughs> um, And I thought it was an important topic to cover because um, a lot of we were just talking about like knowledge workers and how people work in companies, and a lot of work that is taking place nowadays is on a project basis. We have teams, and um, uh, we have people going not not doing the same job in that department, uh, but going from one project to the next, and they can be moved throughout the organization. So it's important to think about how to manage uh, systems on a project basis. So this is based on the uh, on the book by Nick Merlin, in chapter ten, and then the PowerPoint should be prepared by Matthew Michael Matthew. Okay, so um as I said, I won't go through everything, and I've kind of taken out some of the case studies, but I want to go through the main points. Uh, so, so basically, um, we have uh, this, this chapter we'll look at some case studies and uh, what is the concept of uh, project management and how that also involves change management and risk management. And uh, he says the companies are in the in the business in three businesses: infrastructure management, customer relationships, and product innovation. So these are the three main uh, deliverables of businesses: the managing infrastructure, the dealing with customers, and the um, providing product innovation. He says an IS department can also be uh, viewed as being in the same three businesses. In this case, they compare operations uh, to be the same as uh, infrastructure management, and then they compare the help desk tasks to be the same as customer relationships, and systems development is the same as uh, product innovation. So if we're looking at what the IS department might be working with the information systems, which is what they, the areas in which they would be working. As usually the, the goal of infra infrastructure management is to reduce costs. So you want to improve your operations uh, by reducing costs. And the, so you provide the infrastructure that involves fixed costs and the battle is to um, uh, control the to build the scale, so to build the system to the size in which it's needed. And management focuses on efficiency and often on conformance to standards. So if there is a need to outsource work, then uh, the standards help uh, to do that also because it allows other groups to um, provide the same management to the same infrastructure. When we look at the example about um, about the um, um, the systems concern. There's a there's a chapter. Okay. Uh, the the um, article 
by uh, Kai Olsen in the Marvel Films. It's called The Devil He's in the Details. Uh, this is talking about um, how telecommunication companies, telecom operators, manage uh, systems like back office operations and support systems. And so those are the OSS, the operation support systems. And these are examples of types of um, um, operations that the IS uh, management needs to be able to manage and take care of. And so if there are, just talking about the telecommunication industry having standards to allow different types of competitors to come in and provide service because the standards define the interface for these services. So um, in order to allow other companies to, in order to allow outsourcing, we also need to have standards in place as well. On customer relations, the goal is to provide good customer service and a PC support and help desk can also outsource this. Uh, it can be done um, um, informally. But this was also the point about um, whether to be things simple and difficult, whether to outsource uh, to customer service. Really. And product innovation, the goal might be to be able to provide uh, new services, better services, but also can be um, provided um, with nimbleness, meaning flexibility. And the key to success, they say here, is that you have some um, talent, so you have a knowledgeable work staff that enables you to provide this uh, product uh, innovation. Um, uh, so much work today is done in organizations by using projects. We don't have uh, people that are working on, on one department on one thing forever, but they, they can be organizing uh, work and according to projects. And projects often have a beginning and an end. Uh, so maybe if you create project teams, the teams will be together and close the four month period or six month period or whatever however long it takes to get done with the project. And then people, even though they have roles in the company, they might be assigned to different projects. Um, so project management is um, management of projects, and it sounds easy, but a lot of times people think it's just management of technology. But actually, it's the management of technology within the organization and involving these people in the management of the project. So project management is a collection of tasks and activities undertaken to achieve a specific goal. And as I said before, it has a clear start point and an end point. Uh, it should be a finite amount of time. And that the, um, it says the project management is 10% technical and 90% common sense. Uh, but maybe it's not just common sense, but it's management skills. It's being able to manage resources, to the people, um, and interest and allowing the resources to interact with one another, and um, getting things done on time. Okay. Um, Okay, so project management um, encompasses five processes, and this is uh, initiating, planning, executing, controlling, and closing. And I, I feel that I really want to just write those points down because um, I will probably point them out later. So I'm just going to say that these phases for project management and it's initiating.
think of it as a process from beginning to end, those are the main phases of the process. And, um, and then uh, to become a certified project uh, manager, I don't know what this practitioner probably, I uh, have to be able to cover nine areas, uh, and this is um, integration, scope, time, cost, quality, human resources, communication, risk, and procurement. So the first uh, phase in initiating the project, I usually look at um, uh, who is responsible for doing what and what are the basic uh, goals and milestones and who is part of the project team and what is the scope of this. So this is actually an important stage because it identifies the scope of the project and who is involved and the communication that has to take place between those who are involved. And so we identify these, those who are involved as maybe the project team, but also the extended group of stakeholders. So people that are not involved in the design of the project or the management of the project can also be involved because they need to, they have uh, their needs and expectations. So um, once we set up the project, um, then uh, you need to be able to uh, manage the schedule of the project. And this is like um, phase two, the big timing. So we have, um, there can be different types of schedules. You can break this down into sub uh, lines. And, and so you might have a time plan where you have uh, different groups or it's also for one part of uh, and then you have these, some people are like overlapping in their activities, different groups, and then eventually go from the start. So if this is time, and these are different uh, role one, role two, and so forth, you have a time plan which is going to start when people are involved in the project and when they're involved simultaneously. Uh, other things that need to be done are managing uh, the finances, keeping track of the cost, and managing the. And these are all like the scheduling and the, the planning and the scheduling. Uh, it's also part of the execution of this. And then uh, you need to be able to control, so you manage the finances, uh, check on what's being spent, and then uh, look at the um, benefits, managing. How um, the, the outputs that you're getting or things being delivered on time. So, a lot of times with um, um, uh, these types of time times, time there's like the expected uh, date of delivery. And they could be called different things, but this could be like um, uh, when the, the due date. So, uh, this would be like a point when different outcomes are expected. You might break these up into, like, instead of a uh, person, a role one, role two, it could be working group one, working group one, working group two, and they have to do certain tasks, and there might be certain milestones or dates when they have to report on. Uh, we've met this um, target outcome on time, or we're delayed with this target outcome by a certain number of days. But just checking on that. Uh, another important role of the project management team is to uh, look at the risk management. What are the risks? And um, how do we uh, avoid the risk? How do we manage the risk? And to keep track of what, um, how things are changing over time. So there's a case study in here that talks about uh, different risks of the project, the different stages of the project. So, at some point, uh, there may be a risk of getting of people being against the project. And then, at the start phase, maybe people are more accepting of it. So, that risk goes down. But then, maybe some other risks can rise up instead. And then, uh, evaluation or soliciting independent reviews to see on how things are going. So, you might have some sort of group that's not involved in the actual project, looking at it, see if you're on time and on budget. Okay. 
Um, so, um, it says that um, it often seems that uh, technically open systems are, are successful systems, and it's not. So, what they're saying here is that um, uh, it's not just about technical implementations, but it's also about people. And that the people within the organization or the stakeholders have to accept and use the system. So, um, it's about suddenly um, involving um, getting technical systems first, but change management. And change management is usually associated with the psychological acceptance of the people involved in using the system. So it says change management is the process of assisting people to make change in their work environment. Change caused by the introduction of new computer systems. And this is what we talked about in previous chapters as well, getting people to accept uh, the change. As is uh, normally people may resist change when um, when uh, they have it doesn't support their role, it doesn't support their um, their um, abilities within the company. Uh, and so, um, ways of uh, showing resistance is to uh, circumvent the system and to fix uh, the uh, or um, not adhere, not use the system at all. Um, and maybe they also have resistance people distorting information of what they hear. Um, yeah. So, this is suggested a way for introducing uh, or for managing change. And they say that there should be uh, you know, three different types of people involved. There should be a sponsor, and that is the group that legitimizes the change. This could be the uh, top management, for example. And then there's a change agent, and that's a person or group who causes the change to happen. And they're actually like they may be a project manager that's actually implementing the change. And then there's a target, and that's the person or group that um, who's expected to implement the change, who's making use of it, and this would be who's ever involved in going to be using the system. So there's three basic types of people. Okay, so one of the things you should do is uh, you can uh, conduct a survey with all three groups to determine whether the scope of the project is doable, whether the organization is trying to change too much at one time, uh, whether the sponsors are committed uh, enough to push the change through, that's top management, are you supporting it? And whether the change agents have the skills to implement the change, that's the project management team, if they can actually implement the change, and which groups are <coughs> respective uh, to the change and, and which are are receptive to the change and which are resistant. So who is accepting it and who is not accepting it? And if you identify a group that's not accepting it, you need to dig further and find out why they're not accepting it. And then it's important to have the top support, the support from the top management, and also to uh, maybe have training programs to train either the public management team for implementing the change or to train the stakeholders for how the new technology will work so that they may be more accepting of the change. So it's, um, it's it's important to be in contact with all of these three groups. So they're suggesting um, an example of uh, a company called DOC. I don't really know what that stands for anymore. <coughs> and um, um this was a company that was introducing a device uh, called a uh, point of delivery handheld device, and I believe they were um, they were delivering things to customers, and then the drivers would have these point of delivery devices with them, and when they got to the customer, they would record the delivery of those goods. And then they had a workshop that talked about with the drivers, for example. Um, so the sponsors were the management, and uh, the work that the sponsors should be able to issues with the company's ability to promote change uh, and obstacles. And the team realized that only 
And I think you can only put the tools in place and that the organization has to make the change and sponsors need to drive change through the organization. Um, so uh, this was um, that the, the organization cannot say you have to use these terminals. They actually have to uh, talk to the drivers and you know, teach them how to use the terminal. So, um, um, okay, so the process of paperwork for delivering gas products and invoicing customers. Okay, so they were delivering um, gas products. I don't know if that is the gas product. <laughs> but there was a, obviously somebody had to go to the customer. And so it has handwriting and uh, point of delivery. Oh, they used to have these uh, handwriting invoices, and then they changed over to point of delivery devices. And it says the schedule was downloaded overnight, and you tap the shop at night, and then the card uh, accepts the signature of the customer and sends the receipt. And the billing data is automatically sent to the headquarters. So this was supposed to be what the new and change is going to be. And then the team members absorb each other's uh, knowledge and become one into rather than two. So um, um, I think thinking that the, um, uh, the management at the central office, which would be downloading the schedule, that would be a better communication with the team that was delivering the, and getting the, the uh, customer signature. And um, involvement of middle management, uh, this would be uh, the management team. So if we go uh, back here, there are these teams and agents for the management team. So the sponsors is the top management making the decision to use the pods. The management team is the, to be included in the advisory team. <coughs> and also the, uh, the management that is carrying out the schedule and then the target is the drivers that have to make use of the card system. So uh, the advisory council provides feedback and some recommended changes and implementation issues and that's the communication upward and the communication downward is to describe uh, recommendations to employees to get uh, their advice. Uh, so the drivers just had a six-hour training course, and um, they were given like scenarios about how to use the the pod system, the perfect day with the pod, and then they were given some other scenarios. And then the uh, the pod team assessed its um, people's aspects at the outset. Um, so they held a sponsorship event involvement in email management and we had the advisory council. Okay, so they had two different groups and an advisory council. And uh, thoroughly informing the trainers and training advisors. So, okay, so this was the top management. The middle management was um, responsible for setting up the schedules and getting the drug truck drivers to buy into the system. And they had a separate advisory council that was advising the middle management about how to do this. And they were talking with both the upper management and with the drivers to get, they were probably doing the survey that was discussed. And then uh, the truck drivers came to use the system. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, risk management is not only about um, um, a lot of projects uh, fail, and it has uh, not only to do with the technical reasons, but also with the uh, business reasons. And um, so, risk management is supposed to look at the risk of the whole project management, and it can involve both technical risk and business risk. And um, uh, when I show you the Ericsson annual report, I'm showing you one from 2011. 
calendar. They have one for 2012, and that was well up on their website, but I just picked one from 2011. They have a bunch of risk factors. And uh, for this company that is listing risk factors in annual reports, they categorize them, categorize them under market technology and business risk. So in addition to this thing, the uh, technical and business risk, they also list market risk because they see themselves as part of a larger market. And this might be some to a particular project. So then we look at this um, technical and business risk. Uh, the technical risk is um, <coughs> maybe uh, with the project, like when you have a start time, and at the end time, you have to see that it's completed within that time. But uh, there may be certain requirements that you put on. Like the software has to be able to accept new customers. It has to be able to uh, change the uh, the dialing time for the customer to be switched over to different. If the customer comes up, the customer goes. So there's certain requirements that are made within the software when you um, create a service level agreement. A customer who is a stakeholder and the IS project team that's developing the code. And if there is um, uh, some, the customer ends up creating more uh, requests from the way, this is what they call as a uh, scope creep, meaning that they're making uh, their demands bigger than what they did at the start of the project. So that could be a risk in that the project doesn't uh, meet the customer's expectations or it doesn't get done in time or it doesn't get done within budget because they have introduced more requirements along the way. So companies try to avoid this issue of scope creep by making the uh, expectations clear in the, in the project in the service level agreement or in the agreement that's done between the customer and the business. Unit. <coughs> and then the business risk is that this uh, doesn't charge properly to use, and these systems are not easily and not as easily built. Uh, there's lots of business risk it has to do with uh, the business's operations. In this case, um, in the Ericsson case, they talk about. Um, uh, the timing of their purchases, um, and then they talk about um, the cost of um, fulfilling uh, contracts and operation costs and uh, allocating different resources. So these are different types of uh, business risks. If they don't know about um, uh, if some, some of the conditions change, uh, they can talk how the business does its operations. Uh, then this can present a different risk. And I'll, I'll read through this a little bit more carefully when we bring up the file. Uh, but the, uh, the way to address risk management is to assess the risk. So you need to be able to identify them and see where the source is coming from and then to mitigate the risk to see what you can do uh, to try to uh, reduce the impact of the risk. Because when you're assessing them, you might, you will know, uh, identify what the risk is, where it's coming from, and what the impact is of uh, if it happens. And then the mitigation is to try to uh, reduce the cost impact. So if you have, um, if you're in a, uh, in a car accident and uh, you have damaged the car, the risk, there's maybe like some 5% risk that you need to discuss with it. And then uh, if it actually happens, there's a damage to the car. And so this is a nice entirely to be able to mitigate the risk, people will do something like buy cars with um, um, that are bright brakes or something like that to try to uh, reduce the, the amount of damage. And then uh, 
with your insurance companies, they don't mitigate the risk. They kind of pay you for the loss if you if it does happen. So there's different ways of um, trying to mitigate the risk and trying to um, um, trying to improve uh, the conditions. So if it happens, it doesn't have such an impact. And then uh, adjust the project management approach. So if you need to change the way you're doing things in order to reduce the risk. So um, uh, step one, so we have this assess the risk. We have, uh, this has uh, three predominant factors. That's leadership and employee perspective and scope and urgency. And this, uh, we use a tree for kind of outlining this. Uh, we have um, the leadership needs to be supporting change. And if the leadership is not supporting change, there's less likelihood that uh, that will, that the project will be successful. So this is usually a, a business risk to the project if you do not have leadership support. And then employees' perspective, uh, whether or not they resist um, uh, the change is a good factor as well. So um, you need to ask, um, um, so you would ask each of these uh, you know, the leaders, are you committed to the business case? Do they understand the change in the work behavior required by the project to succeed? Are they formally motivated to pull up the change? Are they at the appropriate organizational level? Do they have the power? Do they have experience? And do they have in informal power? So that's asking the leaders. Um, and then this is uh, uh, by Gibson. This is the IT enabled business change and approach to understanding the man and understanding management risk from 2003 MIS uh, So this is whether or not the leader is uh, committed and has the right power. And then the employees' perspective, whether or not they are supportive of the change. And then the project scope and urgency. And there's uh, three different types of uh, project approaches, project management approaches. Uh, big bang is uh, if you have um, is, uh, your most uh, likely to succeed with this approach if you have the positive support from the leadership and their abilities. The employee's perspective is positive and, and uh, they have um, they're compliant. And then it's um, the project scope, meaning the scope is not too big, um, it's, it's manageable, and the urgency is it's needed, but it's, it's not like uh, too. It's within a reasonable limit. Uh, so if all of these things are positive, then you can use the big bang approach. And uh, then there's the, so the first top four are the approaches that are most likely to succeed. We have big bang, improvisation, guided evolution, and top down coordination. And then the these uh, next three champion deal-making, uh, champion inclusion, champion guided evolution. These uh, can also work uh, if you have the champion who's like uh, staking their job on it. So they're really dedicated to making this project work. So in that case, those types of management projects can work. And then the last one, mitigate or kill the project. Um, this is the least likely to work. And that uh, you should probably not do the project. You should probably close down the project. Um, so, uh, this is looking at uh, the project uh, management files and uh, mitigate the risk. We have, um, uh, you look at the project management files, which we have here. We have um, um, authoritative or participative, uh, rigid in the budget, rigid or adjustable. 
and uh, there's a the next uh, slide is a table, and I'll just uh, read what's on the previous slide where you look at the table because it's easier for you to do that. Um, so if you have a uh, project uh, budget and deadlines that are fixed, and you have a management style that is authoritative, and you should take a big bang approach. And this is only appropriate when all three factors are positive. So we had the former three, we had the leadership, the employees' perspective, and the project scope were all positive, and you should take the big bang approach. And then uh, just an improvisation, which is um, if you have a budget, um, project budget and deadlines are adjustable, and the management style is participative. And it says leadership and employees um, positive, but the scope and urgency of the project are at risk. And you have a committed workforce that can, ex uh, can adapt. And then uh, the guided evolution, it says uh, you use only when the employee's perception is negative, and they can overcome this by involving the employees. So the guided that we're using is when you may have people that are negative at first, but they can be involved. And then the top-down coordination, only when the leadership factor supports the business change and when the leadership is respected, full-time and highly experienced in leadership business change. So top-down coordination, you need to have strong leadership again. So uh, when you have the strong leadership, you should bang the top down. And the weaker leadership, the more coordination involved. You have a guided to the evolution and improvisation. Okay. Um, so this was an old, also a case in the book about Dow Corning. And they were talking about the implementation of an ERP system. And they were saying of different phases of the project, they talked about the initiating, planning, executing, and so forth. They had different types of risks, so it wasn't the same at every phase of the project. So at the zero phase, they had leadership was high risk, employee perception was high risk, and scope and urgency was high risk. And um, so they would, I don't know. I don't know which place I use. I think we should on the next place. Mm. Okay, so they didn't actually get just getting ready. And um, but basically, they use different approaches for different phases. So it's just, yeah, they didn't use anything there. But then the phase one, they used improvisation. Um, and it says they were concerned with the employees um, that the sentence in the latter phases, uh, so they focus on building commitment. So they used the uh, improvisation, they would have participative management style, and uh, the project budget and deadlines were adjustable. And then in uh, phase two, they used the guided evolution. And that's uh, where they have more fixed uh, budget and deadlines. So they get people committed, and they continue through the pilot, through the pilot project. And then in phase three, they use the top-down coordination. So they had a more strong uh, leadership and adjustable deadlines and budget. And um, so they have a flexible timeline. And then the pilot's uh, success demonstrates the management's determination and shifted the employee perception to the positive. So this made employees more positive. And it's supposed to shift to negative because it was company wide. And then the fourth phase, they had um, implemented the big game approach because they had a um, strong. Uh, management and they had gotten the commitments and they had implemented it company wide at that point. So by the end of 1998, most of the sites had implemented the risk factors and it became positive. And then the 
initial conversion is took 18 months. So the point of this was that in this phase the project the condition between the management and the um, and the companies uh, the participants can change so they can change their management. So uh, the tips for good uh, project management establish ground rules. A lot of this is about um, creating documentation that explains the requirements and making sure that this is known to all of the important stakeholders. Um, gaining consistency in data and following through on the implementation. So if a project is likely to succeed, it's because of the, usually these uh, kind of contributing factors to the success, the kind of public planning, proper user involvement, um, visual management support, um, good change management, working team, monitoring, control, and closure. <coughs> and then the reasons that you may have trouble if it, you don't have uh, the top portion of top management, uh, if you don't have correct planning tools, if you allow this uh, scope creep to occur, uh, if you do not do monitoring or controlling uh, and reporting, and then the, the current capabilities. So, um, uh, you might have to involve uh, training programs if the capabilities aren't there already. Um, another thing is that um, companies uh, usually have the choice of they may have old legacy systems and they need to introduce uh, newer changes to the, to the programs and systems. When you talk about the telecommunications space, uh, that was changing the and service from using wire lines and uh, landline services to using mobile services. And this changes the software in the central offices. And just going over from a um, uh, analog system to a digital system involves a lot of changes as well. So there's definitely changes to the programming. And there's different kinds of ways of approaching this. Uh, you don't always have to replace the whole system, but there's uh, different types of phases to this. And this is what I wanted to show. Basically, um, the next few slides kind of goes into each of these phases in detail, but I'm not going to read through them all. I'm just going to point out that um, the amount of change that you want to do may be low or high, and then there's different types of change that can occur. And they, assist, they make an analogy between what you do to a house and making and what you do to a program or to a product, to a, an information system. And he says that uh, making the code maintainable is similar to like, painting a house. And moving to a new platform is similar to fixing a leaky faucet. So this is restructuring, re-engineering, and then refurbishing is enhancing the output or input of the system, and this is changing the usefulness of the game. Uh, rejuvenation, give it in more strategic goals, uh, add a new grid. Re-architecture, modern, modularize the uh, new blueprint, and remodel the house. Replace uh, with a package of service. This is buy new software that's outsourcing from the and then rewrite the site uh, new from scratch and demolish and rebuild. So then make an LG and then how uh, this the, the more in detail the destruction of the system. So it talks about making um, maybe programs that are fragile to um, be able to uh, work in different layers to maybe expand, expand the, the scope of the, the program. And then we 
restructuring me, these uh, modifying the code so that it runs more efficiently. And um, and giving people the same output every time so you have a consistent set of output for construction. And then re-engineering um, put it up to um, changing the business logic uh, from an existing program or an existing platform to another platform. And this is the concept of reverse engineering we talk about. And then I'm um, going give an example of the example the system. So this is the old system. It's maintainable and, and causing no major problems, but uh, maybe you need to uh, refurbish it. So you could form the input, make uh, new uses of the input. Um, and they say a lot of people, a lot of companies change old systems that may be uh, have a core that they don't want to change, but they can put new systems around it. So that's uh, it's you can use it in different ways. And then rejuvenating the system is um, recognize the potential, clean up the system, make it more efficient, and change the strategic role. So, um, so the answer is to answer the question, how can we provide even more timely information to improve the competitive position in the marketplace? An example is to allow it to feed on the data warehouse. So just making the use of the system in different ways, assigning new roles. I use the example of um, Amazon. And Amazon using web services to rejuvenate the data to give it a strategic role via XML. So they have a lot of data, but now through use of um, XML and feeds, they're able to make use of that data in different ways, so they're changing their interfaces. Uh, we architect the system. Uh, this might be in a case where if you set up the relationship between different parts of the system, uh, it may be able to work in different situations as well. So just designing how different parts of the system relate to each other. And they talk about redesigning uh, the main systems of Toyota so it could be used with different uh, product lines. It becomes more robust and it allows them to deliver applications faster. It then permits future flexibility to the use of other systems. And then I'll replace with a package of service. Um, this is an outlet to uh, buying, outsourcing, buying a system like the um, SAP and applying it to your, uh, to your company rather than uh, developing it in house. And then finally, is uh, rewriting the whole system. And this is probably the uh, what is least done because usually people have to go from what they already have. And uh, but there is cases where you would just start from scratch. Um, so this is uh, another case of a bank, and um, it says they purchased a customer resource management system from another company called Salesforce, and they said it was up and running in six weeks, and it was the same uh, as the old system for running. So. Uh, this, I think this is a case of more like the outsourcing. They didn't rewrite their own system, but they outsourced. Uh, finally, you need to be able to um, look at the benefits of the information system. And um, sometimes it's hard to measure this. You can measure this in financial terms, like increased earnings or shareholder value or revenue. But, um, more likely, uh, the uh, company is also trying to look at uh, other kinds of indirect values. For example, being able to make decisions better, 
being able to identify opportunities, uh, being able to enhance communication with, with people, customers. So there's, uh, these are also values or benefits to a new system. And then uh, we have um, uh, the return on investment is, um, uh, so it's not just um, the um, computer, it's not just the revenues, but it can also be, uh, besides the financial terms, it can be the indirect profits. But what do uh, companies appreciate? They appreciate when um, when companies invest in IT. Um, and so it's just how can we deal with um, dilemmas of, of uh, things being divided? We can distinguish between uh, different roles of the system. We can measure what is important to the management. And we can assess the investments across the organization level. So how do we know what we should invest in. Um, we know that um, information systems can play three roles. They can help other departments do their job better. They can carry out the business strategy and as a product or service can be the basis of another product or service. So we can either help um, um, the organization become more efficient, uh, we can support the business strategy, or we can support public services. Um, so uh, we can measure organization performance uh, by whether we meet uh, the deadlines in time and within budget. We can measure the business value by how it has an impact on our customers and our partners. And we can measure the benefits of products and services by uh, the revenue that can be associated with the products or services. Sometimes the benefits can also be measured in the satisfaction and they talk about customer relationships and also employee morale can be the key measure of the benefits. And then in the assessment, um, we can assess assessments across uh, organizational levels of the individual, division, and corporate. So the investments can be looked at. Um, how they affect individuals, or affect um, departments, or the entire company. And the impact can be on the economic performance, the organizational process, or the technological impact. And the investors uh, value IT investments. Uh, this seems to say that uh, yes. They do. Um, they said that study found every one dollar invested in computers to get 17 in stock market value, whereas one dollar invested in other types of property or inputs uh, only resulted in one dollar in stock market value. There's investments in organizational capital due to adopting the decentralized work practices. Okay, so the conclusions they just say that um, there's a lot of choices to finance management. We need uh, project management skills, um, and we need the support from the sponsors of the stock management. We need to be able to survey all of the levels of the organization to make sure you have the support from all levels. 
and there's different ways to keep software up to date. As that model says, it's 10, ten different types of alternatives. And it um, doesn't mean that you have to start from scratch every time. And it's important to measure the benefits of the Um, so, yes, from this set of notes, I would make sure that you understand, uh, like, this model and also this, um, this model. So those are the two main points. And I would... And that the projects go through different phases as well. So, and understand what is change management, and how you can manage change by identifying the, um, the levels, uh, the different levels in the organization and how, uh, what they can do in the change management process. And then, and then managing risk, the steps are, the steps for risk, mitigate the risk and adjust the project management approach. If you talk about this, 